chairman of the Air Force Commission. He's also chairman of global insurance consolidator Phoenix Group. He teaches courses on regulation of financial markets and central banking at the Paris Institute of Political Science. Uh, and he was, more importantly, the director of the London School of Economics from 2003 to 2011, and before that, chairman of the UK Financial Services Authority. He chairs risk committees at Morgan Stanley and the Prudential, and the author of several books on various financial subjects. He was invited by the chair of the Airports Commission, set up by the current government. Uh, he was invited to chair it at the end of 2012. Not only uh, is he going to reflect on those experiences, he's going to provide some insights into the Airports Commission interim report, the Commission's work program going forward. He's going to speak for a while, and then he's going to take at least 10 minutes of questions. So I do urge you to think about questions for Sir Howard. Sir Howard. Well, thank you, Kirsten. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Um, it, um, it's not Sunday, but we did start with the sign of peace um, to your neighbours. Uh, whether this is going to be um, the new protocol on Newsnight uh, will be interesting to see. Uh, I've often wanted to make a sign to Jeremy Paxman, but not necessarily <laughs> of peace. Um, it was uh, interesting also um, that Kirsty raised the possibility of regional conferences. I would also suggest maybe one in Scotland, which I've always been told you should not call a region. Uh, but perhaps a Scot can get away with that, um, which we, the rest of us, cannot. Uh, also, congratulations to uh, Brenda Dean for her role in this. Um, it's interesting, there are a few people, I think, Brenda being one, Clive Soley, I saw just now another, who have worked very hard over the years to try to push this particular rock up a hill. Um, and I'm always astonished that they managed to remain quite cheerful um, through this process. Uh, this is, I think, a very useful conference. Um, we are looking forward to hearing the comments that people have to make about the shortlisted options and everything else that we put in our report. And so I congratulate Runways UK on organizing it, which I think is uh, a very important part of the process. One of the approaches that we have attached importance to at the Commission is um, a lot of consultation, a lot of debate, uh, trying to build such elements of consensus as can be built. And conferences like this one, I think, are very much in line with the spirit in which we are conducting this exercise. The Commission is now halfway through its work, or about that. Um, and therefore, it's quite a good moment to take stock of where we have come from and where we're going. Now, of course, when we were appointed, we were accused of being in the long grass, that this was just a subject which had been beaten to death many times before, and why didn't the government simply uh, get on with it, and we were just an excuse to delay an obvious decision. I rejected that at the time because it did seem to me that there was a big job to do, and that if you looked back at the last time there was serious consideration given to the shape of the UK's airports, and particularly along the southeast, with the 2003 white paper, that so much had changed since then that it was very difficult to take that as the starting point for a sensible decision now. There's barely any reference in that paper to Dubai. The regulatory environment for airports has changed substantially. The type of equipment airlines are using, the growth of low-cost carriers has continued. The shape of the industry is very, very different from what it was in 2001-2 when the analysis behind the 2003 white paper was being done. So it seemed to me that we might have got ourselves into a problem on airport capacity as a result of politics, uh, but that we were not likely to get out of it without serious analysis. And I was reminded of the rhetorical question once posed by Will Rogers, uh, if it was stupidity that got us into this mess, why can't it get us out of it? Um, but unfortunately, I think that's not likely to be happen, to, to happen, and the only thing that will get us out of this is building a good, strong analytical framework and a lot of consensus about what the problem is and how it might be solved. To be fair, we hear less of the long grass argument now. I think the interim report did show that there are some complex issues to address where consensus is still in short supply. And I mean, of course, things like the future shape of the industry, the balance between legacy 
airlines and low-cost carriers, the balance between hub traffic and point-to-point -point traffic, etc. The interim report, as far as it went, seemed to be fairly well received, though the Guardian said that we were boys who grew up with airfix. Um, in my case, this is true. Um, <laughs> Though, in fact, curiously, I used to make ships um, rather than planes. But Julia King, the member of the commission, was rather upset because she did used to make planes and FX, uh, but the Guardian hasn't noticed that she is not, in fact, a boy. The um, Guardian did seem to have a bit of trouble on the gender front. Um, but uh, it's fair to say that although we had some initial comments, the report, I think, has not yet been fully digested, and I'm very much hoping that the comments we get back today will tell us a lot more about what people think. Certainly, there was a lot of interest in it. I was interviewed by about 20 different parts of the BBC, um, which is always a slightly puzzling, perplexing experience. My staff say that the report trended on Twitter. I'd be more impressed by that if I was sure I knew what it meant. Uh, but today, I'm not going to read out the press coverage or read out the report itself, uh, but I will do three things. One, a brief review of the conclusions, which I hope will be a good starting point for the day. But then secondly, we'll launch the appraisal framework for the shortlisted options, which we are publishing today. Uh, and also say a bit more about the further analysis on the estuary option that we are also starting uh, today and publishing a separate paper on that. Though of course, this is no substitute for reading the source documents, so I encourage you to do so, though not necessarily while I'm speaking. Um, the main conclusions of the interim report were, as has already been referred to by uh, Brenda, that aviation demand will continue to grow, albeit not as fast as it did pre-recession. We have downgraded somewhat the Department of Transport forecasts and included a number of sensitivities in our analysis. But nonetheless, it is clear to us that aviation demand in this country will continue to grow. And that airports in London and the southeast will certainly fill up over the next 15 years. We know, of course, that Heathrow is already full in ATM terms, albeit passenger numbers continue to grow. And others will become full over that period. We analyze very carefully the scope there might be for shifting that demand to other airports elsewhere in the country. And we looked at whether you could use the traffic distribution rules for that. We looked at whether playing tunes on airline passenger duty, uh, air passenger duty, sorry, would work. Um, but I'm afraid we found that there was little scope in either of those two areas that the traffic distribution rules are tight and through international agreements and trying to use them to manipulate where foreign airlines go in particular would be very hazardous in an international perspective. And although you can achieve something by changing uh, passenger duty within an overall uh, constant yield, you have some perverse consequences. You end up with a less efficient distribution of flights, smaller planes, more emissions per passenger uh, carried, um, and you don't get new connectivity. You tend to shift some of the capacity on some thick routes, but you don't actually deliver the kind of new destinations that the economy is going to need. So I'm afraid we drew rather a blank on that piece of analysis. We looked at short-term measures on airspace management and surface access. Here we think these are important. We've made a number of proposals for managing UK airspace better, and we hope the government will pick those up. We made a number of recommendations to improve surface access to our airports, which the Chancellor accepted in his autumn statement, and we hope again that those will be uh, delivered. I'm probably preaching uh, to the choir here on those two issues, but further pressure on the government to make sure these commitments are delivered would certainly be welcome. But none of this is likely to deliver a lot of new slot uh, capacity. There will be some passenger growth through bigger aircraft, but again, not enough to cope with what we expect the increased demand to be. 
And that led us to the conclusion that we did need some new capacity by 2030. We then factored in the climate change commitment, which of course in this country is legislated in the 2008 Act. And we looked at the impact of a very high carbon price, and we looked at what the Committee on Climate Change had said about what kind of demand for aviation is allowable within our overall climate change policy. The committee says that demand can grow by about 60% by 2050 consistent with our emissions targets, and that in it also indicates the need for one new runway uh, at least by 2030. To do more than that would imply somewhat implausible degree of decarbonization of the rest of the economy. But as it happens, this matches what airports themselves were telling us, which was that one new full-length runway can be financed on this timescale, but possibly not more. We think there is likely to be sufficient demand to justify another runway by 2050 if our forecasts are correct. The economic and the environmental case for that would need to be considered carefully closer to the time, as would the location, though of course that will be influenced by what is decided by the government on the basis of our report next year. For that first additional runway, currently the most credible locations in our view are Heathrow and Gatwick. Which of them is the most credible will depend in large part on how we expect demand to develop, whether it will be more legacy and network traffic or more low cost, point to point. There is no great consensus to be seen on this point, and that is something that we will wish to see further debate on, and I'm sure will be a topic discussed today. We did not find the claims of Stansted, Birmingham, and some other new locations for additional capacity in the short run to be very persuasive, though I think it's important to say, and perhaps has got lost a little bit in the discussion of our report, that it's vital that these airports do grow in the interim because the new runway that we want to see will not come on stream until the late 2020s at best. And if this additional demand is going to be accommodated at all, it is going to crucially depend on Stansted achieving an expansion and Birmingham and other places um, as well. So their role in the overall mix of airport capacity is very important indeed, and I hope that is well understood. I'll say a little more about the uh, estuary options later, uh, as I said uh, at the start. So the three specific options that we put on the table are the Northwest Runway at Heathrow, Heathrow Hub, and a second runway at Gatwick. And those options now lead a lot more work. Before I come on to say what that work is, let me just complete the suite of recommendations we made in our interim report, because we also recommended a noise uh, authority. We looked at some international comparisons, particularly in Australia um, and in France. Uh, I know that it's not usually a positive recommendation in this country to say, let's do this because it's done in France. Though some of us perhaps would like to copy some things that are done in France. But um, <laughs> the idea we have is that an authority which would be regarded as independent and objective in terms of how noise should be measured, what the noise implications of new developments, whether of physical developments or increases in uh, capacity in other ways, would we think improve the quality of debate? And we very much hope that when they respond to our report formally in March, the government will pick up that recommendation. So that's the broad shape of what we came out with in our interim uh, report, you may say, how did we manage to produce quite so many pages saying all of that? But um, there is, of course, a lot of analysis behind it, um, which we do think is important for people to read. But that takes me to my second subject, which is the appraisal framework. How do we take forward these three options? And we're publishing a draft of that framework for consultation today. It sets out in some detail how we expect scheme designs to be developed and then subsequently appraised. And we will subject the schemes to a more detailed, wide-ranging and comprehensive analysis than we were able to undertake in phase one of the report, where 
uh, we were dealing, of course, with 40 or 50 proposals. That analysis will also be put to consultation and ultimately will be published alongside the recommendations in our final report to government next summer. Our intention is that the analysis can be used by the government as a strong evidential base to support the delivery of our final recommendation, for example, in the preparation of a national policy statement or a hybrid bill, and to accelerate the preparation of a future planning application by scheme promoters. So we hope to use this period to do quite a lot of the work that would be needed anyway when a government makes a decision. The framework incorporates four interrelated elements. Firstly, the Commission's objectives against which options will be assessed and on which its final recommendations will be based. And these are, in fact, a development of the SIFT criteria that we used in Phase 1. Secondly, an updated scheme design for each shortlisted option to be used as the starting point for appraisal. Thirdly, a business case and a sustainability assessment for each option. And fourthly, a set of appraisal modules explaining the specific methodologies that the Commission proposes to use in assessing the options. We welcome views on any or all of these elements, uh, while noting that the requirement to develop a business case and an environmental assessment for each option is in fact prescribed by our terms of reference, but there's a lot of scope for debate about precisely how the other modules should be formulated and what should be in these assessments. The timetable is that we are inviting comments on the framework published today by the 28th of February. We will publish a revised version in what we are calling the early spring, but precisely when will depend on the scale of the responses. If everybody says it's all perfect, then we'll publish it more quickly than that. Um, we'll then invite the shortlisted option promoters to provide updated scheme designs with a deadline around six weeks after we publish the revised framework. That sounds tight, but of course, people will see from today the, the framework, and one may assume that the broad lines of it will be similar, so I'm sure people will be getting on with that work anyway. And we will then publish the evidence base, including the business case and the sustainability assessment for each option for formal consultation in the autumn. Now, we've chosen objectives which we believe will enhance...